at this time, what do you think is the world's greatest need? And do you have a vision for a new reality? Right. Yes and no. Do I have a vision for a new reality? That That's still something I believe that's forming. But there is a great need in our world right now. And, and part of it is our need to become vulnerable with each other, which I think has happened in these demonstrations that are going on. And at the time that we're recording this show, we're in our second week of demonstrations about freedom, about equality. And there is a vulnerability in expressing that and sharing pain with each other. It makes us need each other and unify in that way. So there is a need for vulnerability and there's a great need for unification. And what brings people together, I think, more than anything else in their shared pain is a sense of compassion and a sense of loving. And sometimes we have to dig deep to find that because we get so politically divided or we get so divided by ideas and ideals that are unattainable and they're out in the ether somewhere that we forget that you know our next door neighbor is still our next door neighbor and they have the same feelings and the same wants, the want of being safe, the want of having love in their lives as we do of ours, regardless of political affiliation or anything else. So I think we have to find a way now to unify. And as far as a vision goes, as I said, that's something that's forming. But in a perfect world, I would see a vision unfold where we celebrated diversity instead of separating out and isolating ourselves like well here's this brown group over here and here's this white group over here here's the muslims over here let's put the christians over here and it's just you know it's this isolated there's walls so i what i picture in a perfect world is this kind of diversity that we celebrate it's like isn't it cool that we're so different we've found a way to live with each other and love each other in spite of our differences. I mean, basically, that's what families have to do. You know, siblings siblings come out of the box differently. True. You know, I look at my brother and my sister sometimes and I go, are we really from the same litter? <laughs> right, Tim and Buddy. Right. <laughs> Family that loves each other, we have learned to live with each other's different ideas, different way of doing things, and we've stayed in love with each other. And that's what the whole world, I think, is looking for right now, is that that basic family value of living together and loving together. Uh, what a wonderful answer. I absolutely love your wisdom. You mentioned love, compassion. What is love to you? Love is the softest place in the heart that opens to someone else and lets them in fully and cherishes that. I just had an experience with the soft part of my heart. I had this beloved dog, a Labrador retriever, that my husband and I adopted 10 years ago. You know, adopting a dog, by the way, is, it's like getting somebody else's teenager. So this kind of wild dog that we worked with, and he became a great dog, and we had to put him down last Monday because he had cancer and he was suffering. You know, there was this initial anguish of losing something that we loved so much. But what it gives way to is that soft spot in my heart that opened to him initially and let him in so completely and reminds me in this time of this, this loss and this grief is that's the soft spot that I want to be in touch with. I think sometimes in this world, we don't weep enough. We open ourselves enough or make ourselves tender enough to experience the love that's available to us. Because I've never met a human being that didn't want love and didn't want to give love. I mean, it's that basic. It comes down to that. So my next question is about the intention of writing your book, A Delightful Little Book on Aging. It's a funny title, isn't it? Yeah. What's compelling about the title is seeing aging and delightful in the right. same phrase. <laughs> doesn't quite fit. It's, a, it's a, a juxtaposition. This book was a compilation book for me. I had been writing novels up until this point, and I had gone through 
uh, what I would call a baptism by fire with the publishing industry because I'd gotten as far as getting an agent and having things showed to publishers and I would get these great rejection letters that told me how much talent I had and we're going to pass. And so one summer I sat down a couple summers ago and I said, you know, I just want to pull together some of the blogs and articles I've written over the years and write some new stuff and and I just want to write a delightful little book on aging. That's exactly what I said. Mm -hmm. And so I pulled the pieces together to do that. And it's um, a slim volume of essays about my aging process. It's not a how-to book. It's not really a self-help book. It's just me sharing this is what it was like for me because I believe we're all connected by our stories. If it's like, if it's this way for me, it's going to be this way for someone else too. And I think we, we learn a lot when we share our stories with each other. So now I'm in the process of writing a larger work again. And I feel that this little book was such a gift to me, even though it was intended to be a gift to you. It's been a gift to me because it gave me that little boost of confidence that I needed to say, okay, I can do this. I can do this. And Failure is a funny thing as we get older. When we're younger and we have failure, it's just heartbreaking. When we're older and we have failure, we think, oh my gosh, am I running out of time? And so I'm here to say, hey, you're not running out of time. There are a lot of women doing things in their older age. I mean, no one would ever say to um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, well, you're too old to be a Supreme Court justice. I mean, you know, she's like the grand, the grand dom of wisdom, you know, in my eyes. Or somebody like a Meryl Streep, well, you're really too young to be in the movies anymore. <laughs> no, Meryl Streep has totally disproved that. Or, or who is the woman that won for, um, she won Golden Globe and Emmy for Best Actress, uh, or not Emmy, I'm sorry, um, Oscar for Best Actress, Renee Zellweger, for her portrayal of Judy Garland, and she's, you know, over 50. And so women are, are stating that, that we can live our dreams out in our older years, we can paint, we can write, we can do art, we can make things. And um, so failure gets, it gets tamped down a little bit. Keep making things, make things till the day you die. Yes, I agree. The chances are we'll be doing whatever it is with more wisdom. So in your book, you say preparing for death has everything to do with how you live life. Talk to me about that. If we are living our lives fully for as long as we possibly can, then death is just the next step because then we will give ourselves to that the same way we give ourselves to life. If we are holding back from living our lives, death becomes more difficult. Maybe we resent the things that we didn't do. Maybe we are upset that we didn't get the closure that we wanted to get that we didn't forgive or get the forgiveness that we wanted to get. So if we're living life in a way that is true, once again, and we've touched upon this so many times throughout this program, if we are living life with an authentic heart, then death seems like an easy letting go because, you know, if, if I died tomorrow and I had one moment to say goodbye, I would say, you know what? I lived life as best I could and as fully as I could for as long as I could. Yeah. And now I'm going to see what's on the other side. 